Hello, this is Professor Teresa Pelkey. This is Session 9, Part 2, Creating an Inner Join for Two or More Tables. To get started, let's take another look at the basic concepts of a relation. I showed this to you in the previous video. We'll look at this again, and I'll show you how to write the SELECT statement to join data from the country table with data in the city table. So here you see the country table on the left and the city table on the right. The SELECT statements used to get the result sets are simple SELECT ALL statements. The country table contains the country code and the country name. The city table contains the country code. What we want to end up with is a result set that looks like this. We want to see all of the data in the city table, and we also want the country name to be in the result set. To get the country name included in the result set, we can join the country table and the city table. We'll join the tables on the country code value. Recall that both tables have a country code column. So here is a SELECT statement that we can use to join the data from the country table with the city table. Let's start with the parts of the statement that should be familiar. Those parts include the SELECT and its column list, the FROM keyword and clause, and the ORDER BY clause. What is new in this statement are the JOIN and ON keywords and clauses. We'll be taking those clauses apart in the next few slides. First, look at the result set. You'll see that it includes all of the data in the city table, and it also includes the country name. Keep in mind that the country name value is in the country table. So what we are seeing here is a result set that includes data from two tables. Notice that when the country code value changes, the country name value also changes. In this result set, there are two country codes, AFG for Afghanistan and NLD for Netherlands. The FROM clause specifies city as the name of the table to select the data from. Notice that we have assigned a table alias to the city table using the AS keyword. That keyword is followed by the alias value CI. The next line is the JOIN keyword. This keyword is used to specify a table name that is to be joined to the table that is in the FROM clause. The JOIN clause is similar to the FROM clause. There is the table name COUNTRY, the AS keyword, and the table alias value CO. The ON keyword is used to introduce the columns and conditions that will be used to join the tables. Following the ON keyword, you specify the columns that are in the tables that are used for the join. In this case, the join is based on the city table's country code and the country table's code value. Notice that the column names do not have to be the same. The data types have to be the same. In this example, the country code and the code columns are defined as character data three characters long. If the data types are not the same, you can still use the columns, but you will need to use the cast function to cast one of the columns to the other's data type. In this case, we are using what is called an equijoin. That means that we will join the two tables on the country code and code values when they contain the same value. For example, the city table contains the country code column. For the cities in Afghanistan, the country code value is AFG. That value AFG is joined to the code column in the country table. If you look in the country table, you'll see that there is one row in that table where the code value is AFG. Once the corresponding row is located in the country table, the values in the other columns in that table are available. Now look up at the column list in the SELECT clause. There are six columns in the column list. The first column, ID, is contained in the city table. Because the ID column is only in that table, 
the column name does not have to be qualified or identified as belonging to that table. The next column name in the list is the name column. Now we have a problem since both the city and the country tables have a column named name. So we'll do two things with the name column. First, we'll use the table alias value CI to qualify the first name column as the one that belongs to the city table. Second, we'll assign a column alias named city so that when you look down at the result set, the second column is named city, not name. Back to the column list. The district column is only in the city table, so there is no table qualifier or column alias. The population column is used in both tables, so it is table qualified to indicate that the value from the city table is to be used. The country code column is only in the city table. The second name column is table qualified as belonging to the country table using the CO table alias. It is assigned a column alias of country name. So we have a select statement that joins the city and country tables based on the country code value in the city table and the code value in the country table. We've defined a column list to include all of the columns that are in the city table and the name value that is in the country table. We've table qualified the column names that are contained in both tables, and we've assigned column aliases to make it clear in the result set where the value is coming from. So let's take it apart a little bit more. Let's look at how the column and table aliases are used. In the column list, you'll see that two columns are assigned a column alias value. The name column in the city table is assigned an alias value of city. The name column in the country table is assigned an alias value of country name. You can see how both of those column aliases show up in the result set. The from and join clauses specify the tables to be used and the table alias values. For the city table, the alias value is CI. For the country table, the alias value is CO. Many times you'll see a table alias value specified as a single character. You can use a single character if you want to, but in this example, what character would you use? If you use C, since that is what the table names begin with, you'd have a duplicate alias, which is not allowed. Some people would use aliases like A and B in this situation. I think it is easier to work with if you use a two or three letter alias based on the first few characters of the table name. Once the table aliases are defined, you see that the table aliases are used in the column list and the table aliases are used in the on clause. Keep in mind, whenever you use a column name in a select statement, if the column name only occurs in one table, you don't need to qualify that column name with a table alias. For example, the table aliases are used in the on clause, but strictly speaking, are not needed in this case. This slide is the same as the previous, with the exception that the as keyword is not used for either the column alias values or the table alias values. Some database management systems might require the use of the as keyword. In this case, MySQL does not require the as keyword for either the column or table aliases. You'll see a lot of SQL examples and real-life code where the as keyword is not used for the table alias. For the column list, it may be a good idea to use the as keyword to define a column alias. Now, if you look at the column list shown on this slide, it's not too hard to pick out the column names and the alias names. But you need to keep in mind that in a lot of SQL that you'll see, it will not be formatted like what you see here, a vertical column list. Usually, you'll see a long, long statement with all of the column names listed on the same line. 
When the names are all in the same line, it can be hard to figure out what is a column name and what is a column alias. The as keyword puts some separation between the two values. Here you see what happens when you do not assign a column alias and you have columns in both tables that have the same name. In this example, the city table has a column named name and the country table has a column named name. As you can see, the statement runs successfully and generates the result set shown here. Now, if you are just going to look at the results set in MySQL Workbench or maybe export the results to Excel, this might be okay. A person looking at this can figure out that the name column on the far right is the country name. But if you need to write SQL, that will be used in an application, for example, to use with PHP code, it will be much easier to work with the result set if you assign unique column names using column aliases. In this case, if you fed this result into PHP, you would need to access both of the name columns based on their position within the result set. If you assign unique column names, you can access the columns based on the unique column value. This variation shows what happens when you have no table and no column aliases. When you do not have table alias values, you can still table qualify column names. It's just that you will need to specify the full table name. For example, in the column list, you can see that the first name column and the population column are table qualified with the city table name. The second name column is qualified with the country table name. The on clause also uses the table qualifiers, although again, if the column name only appears in one table, the column name does not need to be table qualified. So now that we've taken this select apart, let's put it back together. This slide shows my preferred format for writing this type of statement. To start with, I'll define table aliases as two or more letters, and I'll make the alias values related to the table name. I'll use the as keyword to define table aliases. In the column list, I'll use the table qualifier for all of the columns, even if the column name is only used in one table. The reason for always specifying the table qualifier is to make it easy to know which table the column belongs to. In some select statements, you might have dozens of columns and use more than two tables. Rather than try to remember which tables the columns are defined in, you can just put the table alias in front of the column name. For any column that is named the same in more than one table, I'll define a column alias introduced by the as keyword. Finally, in the on clause, I'll table qualify the column names. This is just an example of how I would write this statement. As you've seen on the previous slides, there are a lot of variations you can use. If you're just learning to work with SQL, you may want to try different ways of writing statements. What usually happens is that over time, you'll settle into a statement style that works for you. You'll find that your work with SQL or any programming language will be much easier if you pay attention to style and you settle on a workable style. When necessary, you can make adjustments or variations. Let's take another look at the join and on keywords. At the top of the slide, you see two blocks of statements, including the from, join, and on keywords. These two blocks are equivalent. The keyword join by itself is a shortcut for inner join, which is a specific type of join that is to be performed. You can join more than one table, and you'll see an example of that on the next slide. The on clause specifies the columns that are used to join the data between the tables. The concept of an inner join is based on a mathematical set theory. This Venn diagram from the Wikipedia link shown at the bottom left shows that an inner join includes rows from the first set, identified as A, and the second set, identified as B, only when there is something in common between a member of either set. In our example of the city and country tables, we are including rows from the city table and the country table only when there is a match on the country code column. So what does that mean? 
It means that if we have a row in the country table that does not have any corresponding rows in the city table, that country table with no cities will not appear in the result set. It also means that if we have any rows in the city table that have a country code that does not match any country row in the country table, those city rows will not appear in the result set. In fact, with the sample database, all of the countries have at least one corresponding city row, and all of the city rows have a corresponding country row. So in our examples, the inner join does not exclude any data from either table. Now that does not mean that you will always need to select all of the data in both tables. You can exclude data by using a WHERE clause to select just the rows that you want from either or both tables. What I mean is that the inner join for these tables does not exclude any data since it finds at least one match for all of the rows in both tables. So keep in mind, inner join, which is the default join type, means that you will get a row in the result set only when there is a match between the tables that you specified in the from and join clauses. You are not limited to joining just two tables. This select statement shows an inner join using the city, country, and country language tables. In this case, the on clause is a Boolean condition that joins the city and country language tables to the country table based on the country code value. To make the result set easier to work with, I am specifying a WHERE clause to only select rows where the country language is official value is T for true. If you look at the result set, you can see that we still have the city name, district, and the city population. We have the country code, which is in the city table, and the country name from the country table. We also have the language, which is an official language in the country. As you can see, the city in Afghanistan is listed twice. The reason why it shows up twice is because there are two official languages in the country language table for Afghanistan. The cities in the Netherlands only appear once since there is only one official language. Finally, there is another way that you can write an inner join as shown here. Notice that this select statement uses only the select, from, where, and order by clauses. There is no join or on keywords or clauses. At first glance, you might think this is better since the statement is shorter and you don't need to use the other keywords. But this style of writing and inner join is considered to be obsolete and is not a best practice. A best practice is what is generally considered within the industry to be the preferred or best way to accomplish something when you have more than one choice. In this case, the industry is people who write SQL statements as part of their profession. If you're just writing SQL for yourself or your own computer, it really won't matter what you write. But if you're being paid to write SQL for somebody else, it will usually be best to find out what the current best practices are in the industry and use those. Best practices can and do change over time. At one time, what you see here was the best practice since it was the only way you could write a join of this type. When the join and on keywords were introduced into SQL, the best practice shifted to using those keywords. Part of being a developer is to commit to keeping up with the best practices for the tools you are working with. For example, there will be best practices for SQL, for JavaScript, for PHP, or for any other tool or environment you'll work with. In other words, don't write a join like this. Use the join and on keywords, which are now considered to be the standard and preferred way to express a join. In the next session, we'll look at the other types of commonly used joins. Those include outer joins, left joins, and right joins.